Bradshaw. I'm an American cisgendered queer artist and activist. I live and work in the San Francisco area, and I use uh, him, he, him, his pronouns. Uh, my formal background is in art, industrial design, and like mechanical and electrical engineering. Uh, I work as a fabricator, a sculptor, and a professor um, in the design department at San Francisco, San Francisco State University. Um, I think that mentioning that I'm cisgendered is really important because a lot of the issues I'm going to talk about uh, affect the lives of trans folks to a much greater degree than they affect my own. And I'm going to do my best to uh, be sensitive to that and uh, do more listening than talking on topics related to that. Thanks for coming. Anyway, I forgot to say that, so I put it in the slide. Um, I have to try to do that anymore. Oh, it's okay. Oh. Um, yeah, just a quick uh, thing about terms. The, I said the word cisgender earlier. Um, those of you who haven't encountered it before, it's a word that essentially just means uh, not trans. You know, anyone who is not a trans person is considered a cisgender person and it comes from the prefix cis meaning same and uh, gender meaning gender and it's for somebody's gender, uh, which is you know, the social uh, encumbrance of uh, what it is to be a man or woman or something else. Uh, happens to match uh, the sex they are assigned at birth. Um, I uh, gen more or less in this talk. I use terms related to sex and gender interchangeably because more or less the architecture of gendered bathrooms also uses these terms interchangeably. You know, people refer to a men's bathroom as often as the male bathroom, um, and so forth. Um, the premise of this talk is that bathrooms are fraught with design problems. There are, uh, every bathroom has a history of ableism, racism, sexism, transphobia, um, and <laughs> the list just goes on. It's a space that's especially fraught, I think, because of how difficult it is to talk about this space, um, because of the embarrassing notion of the subject matter, and, uh, the social costs are complaining about it. A curiosity I find about the toilet um, is that it actually doesn't have any name that is not a euphemism. Uh, every word for the toilet, including toilet, is a euphemism that meant something else. And what happens with these euphemisms is they're used for you know 50 or 100 years, and then the old definition is lost, and it becomes like the word toilet, for example, none of us know what it used to mean, but now it just means the, you know, the porcelain machine that we do our business upon. Uh, but when toilets were introduced, <laughs> toilet was clearly a euphemism. It was known to everybody to be a French piece of furniture used for the application of cosmetics. And then the word toilet became vulgar because it's the other side of the euphemism was lost and it was replaced with another slew of euphemisms. Um, but other than shitter and shit school, there is no word for the toilet that is not, in fact, itself a euphemism. <laughs> including latrine, toilet, washroom, WC, water closet, powder closet, powder closet, powder room, laboratory, potty, outhouse, crapper, pisser, ruby, can, john, blue, little boys, little girls, ladies, men's, restroom, and the facilities. How is the crapper a euphemism? <laughs> uh, it's the last name of the person who uh, modernized the plumbing portions of the flush toilet in the 1870s. Crap is probably actually the result of oh. the <laughs> It is. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, the word, uh, the word shit wasn't a swear word until, I think, the 1800s. It was just the word for poop. But then Victorian sensibilities, I think, pushed out any direct reference to the body as vulgar. And I think that's what started this chain of expiry, where every word that relates to the body expires after a generation has to be replaced with a new word. Um, the biggest problem, or a big problem, especially in San Francisco, where you know tens of thousands of people are struggling with you know, chronic housing insecurity, is there just aren't enough public toilets. Um, in New York City, there were 1,676 public toilets before 9-11, and after 9-11, there are 10, and these are all in the MGA um, subway system. In a stroke of a pen, the Department of Homeland Security decided there was some vague security threat with having a bathroom underground, 
and all the transit agencies in the country were just like, oh, hot dang. <laughs> we can shut all these down and save a ton of money. Um, 20 of BART bathrooms were closed following 9-11, leaving only the above ground stations with bathrooms. And since the above ground stations are prim primarily in suburban neighborhoods, those don't really serve the needs of the poor. Um, similarly, public restrooms, uh, uh, you know, uh, England used to have tens of thousands of public restrooms on the street, and 40% of those have closed in the past uh, 20 years. Um, there are sometimes thought to be three kinds of privacy uh, relating to toilets, and uh, shit stools, toilets, water closets are lacking in all three. Uh, the first kind is visual, um, the ability to do your business unseen. Um, this is especially bad in the United States, where um, some sadistic weirdo sometime in the past hundred years decided that the proper space between the floor and the bottom of the stall partition is 12 to 18 inches. Um, additionally, they decided that uh, there should be no design insistence on a flange or a flap where two panels meet. So there's often a, a half inch gap in exactly that point that exists intentionally for the purpose of surveillance. And this is something, you know, if you look up on the website that people will tell these things, they're like, why are all these gaps there? And you're like, you don't want people doing unsavory things in the bathroom. And it's like, I don't. <laughs> I don't care at all about people doing unsavory things in the bathroom. These latches were designed so poorly that you can't, the only way to tell whether an American bathroom stall is occupied is by slowly scanning your head left to right and getting a panoptic view of the entire contents of the stall. And this is considered normal bathroom behavior. These partitions exist not for safe privacy or security, but for the, like this insane double sense of privacy and security, where you're supposed to feel like you can't be seen while fully aware that you can be seen and you are being seen. And the floor gap, um, there are legal and logical reasons to have a small floor gap. You know, air ventilation, smell ventilation, uh, people in wheelchairs can more easily do a 360 if their toe plate can slide underneath the doors handing toilet paper back and forth, um, you know, telling if somebody has collapsed, but none of these things necessitate a gap larger than this. By having it that large, anybody in the bathroom can tell the footwear and thus the identity of you know, their coworker or you know, the gender presentation of the person in the toilet. And I'm confident that all of these design decisions have been are an intentional um, conservative sensibility that goes into the design of the American bathroom. Um, European style toilet traditions, where the walls between the toilets are actually walls, and where the doors uh, almost meet the ground, are shockingly rare in the United States. And I believe they might actually require a variance in order to comply with American plumbing codes. For example, in San Francisco, uh, this style of bathroom, uh, if it's for people, if it's for all people, uh, would require a variance to be built um, because the national and state and local plumbing codes require gendered bathrooms. Uh, and according to an architect friend of mine, the two uh, variances for this that she submitted have both been rejected in the past few years. What's a variance? A variance, if there's a rule and you don't want to follow it, um, it's the method you use to get, get out of it. And uh, for building codes, for example, if you have a historic building and it can't have a handicap ramp, you can get a variance to install like an elevator instead. Um, acoustic privacy, the ability to not be heard in a toilet stall. And this one's a little bit complicated because um, acoustic privacy, uh, full, complete acoustic privacy can be dangerous. Um, you want somebody in duress inside of a bathroom stall to be able to signal for help. Um, but uh, rest assured, Japan to the rescue. Yes. Uh, this <laughs> is a close up of a Toto wash lit uh, toilet seat bidet which is an amazing machine that heats water uh, and blasts it at several pressures, temperatures, and uh, pulse setting styles at uh, any of your holes. Um, and uh, many of them also have a feature of drying and of playing uh, water sounds or other sounds in order to mask the sound of your illumination. Um, Many models also have a deodorizer, where, uh, which makes a little bit of noise as it uh, sucks air through a carbon filter and uh, replaces 
uh, any sense you might have created with sense of Toto's design. Uh, they are slowly making inroads in the American market, which is something I'm pretty excited about. Uh, olfactory privacy, a fancy way of saying smell E. I don't know any other adjective for smells. Smell? Smell related? <laughs> oh, that's it. There's no side for that. But yeah, the, having uh, at least side doors that go top to bottom, forced air ventilation, and other things that we expect everywhere else in our home uh, would go a long way toward providing that type of privacy. Um, I am a unapologetic proponent of all bathrooms being gender segregated. And to start off, start off why, I thought I would start with a bunch of red slides about the negative aspects of gender segregated restrooms. It was less red on my screen, so you can perceive this with less severity than the severity that's currently being pushed at. Should, should I save my question for the end, or should I? No, that's fine. Do you think that privacy is important uh, for bathrooms? Do you think we should be trying to achieve these kinds of privacy? Or? That's a great question. To me, uh, as an individual, privacy isn't important at all. The best bathroom experiences I've had have been like a bench with like 15 holes in it, and you can talk to your friends. Um, I am not attempting to reprogram all of society to hegemonically believe what I believe. There are lots of reasons why people need privacy that frankly aren't any of my business that relate to you know, religious restrictions, to um, insecurities, to medical conditions I shouldn't be privy to. Uh, they could be escaping somebody who's pursuing them. You know, they could, they could be doing drugs, they could be doing all the you know, prescription or otherwise. And I think that people having the option for privacy is a really important thing in public restrooms. And I think that if we pulled like if we asked around, I think everybody would agree with that. Uh, and I think it would only be under like actual examination of the privacy that we're allotted that people would realize that there is no privacy in the current public restroom unless you're in a place that's fancy enough to have you know, individual bathrooms per, per user. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, medical issues, there's a non-use of facilities. Um, at the risk of reading my slide out loud, 54% of the 93 transgender persons surveyed report physical complications like dehydration and urine tract infections related to intentionally not peeing because of bathroom anxiety. Um, the similar statistics uh, and a paper that I couldn't find, but I'll find later, uh, Indian women, uh, women in India, Public restrooms in India are very, for women, are extremely rare, and there's a lot of stigma around their use. Um, and I uh, read some translated interviews with Indian women and girls who, like, talked at length about the strategies they use to go entire days without urinating, uh, because the alternative is just uh, that costly, socially or difficult um, logistically. So bathroom access is. For every single person, uh, a medical issue, and for people who are marginalized, uh, such as you know, transgender and non-gender non-conforming pers persons, it's a huge medical issue. They have to choose between like potentially getting assaulted or confronted or damaging their um, urinary system. Just a fun anecdote to go with this. So Tycho Brahe, uh, an astronomer, uh, he died from a burst bladder because he was at a dinner with the king, and he felt like at a play because he could not get up from the table. Wow. That's not a good way to go. <laughs> um, people with disabilities often have attendants of a different gender. Um, you know, this is a classic example, and it's one of the few examples where uh, legal protections have existed for, you know, prior to like 2015, 2016, hubbub around around bath bathrooms, where uh, several states have provisions stating that an attendant of any gender may accompany a disabled person of any gender into the bathroom of the disabled person's choosing. But still, it puts people in a position, disabled people in a position where if they have to use the bathroom, they have to consider the embarrassment of themselves, the embarrassment of their intended, and all of the awkward interactions that go into something that already is frankly embarrassing, which is you know, using a building, using a space that was clearly designed for a different kind of person um, and requiring help to do so, uh, which can be, you know, that alone can be a, a, a tough pill to swallow and to have complicated gender things on top of it makes it more complicated, especially considering that 90% of personal care attendants are women. 
Um, who here is sort of stereotype threat? Cool. Um, the study I used to describe stereotype threat is, I believe, a group of 100 boys and 100 girls were given the same math test. Uh, each of these groups were split into 33 or so subgroups, and the first group um, was told that this is a test that is going to determine the mathematical... I think all the, the people were told the same thing, which is that this is a math test, you're going to test your math prowess. The first group just took a multiple choice test. There was no, nothing else on the test but multiple choice. Second group wrote their name and took a multiple choice test. Third group wrote their name, indicated their gender, and then took the same multiple choice test. And stereotype is the, threat, is the concept that um, the lingering threat of resembling a stereotype that you embody, for example, in the case of women and, and girls, or in this case, girls of being socially thought too bad at math, the anxiety of taking a math test while thinking about the fact that girls are bad at math is enough to drop your score significantly. So I think there was like a 5 to 10 percent drop for writing your name and another 5 to 10 point drop for writing your name and circling your gender. So I would argue that anything that any system that repeatedly and systematically inf uh, implies that there are structural, significant, biological, and intrinsic differences between groups of people is going to, in turn, emphasize and remind people of associated stereotypes. Uh, for example, you know, like waiting in, like you taking the uh, standardized test, and you had to go to the restroom in the middle, and there was a line for the women's room, and you were reminded of all of these things and seeing the sign, or reminded of the fact that like womanness is a is a thing. There is a chance that that could psychologically um, detriment your performance on said test. Uh, a paper by these individuals uh, found that um, they switched bathroom signs in workplaces and then polled uh, women and minorities about uh, like using standardized inclusion metrics like for how inclusive a space feels and found significant increases in um, perceptions of welcomeness and perceptions of equity uh, in the organization when all they changed about the organization was gender neutral bathroom signs. Same thing, but the opposite, where you're reminded you know, every day that this is a space that you know, isn't concerned with arbitrary and outdated boundaries, uh, there seems to be an increased uh, increase in equity culture. Uh, potty parity and the impossibility of equal weights. So most states and municipalities have what are called potty parity laws that say that you know, if you have a men's bathroom with three stalls and four toilets, you must have a women's bathroom with nine stalls. So with not sorry, nine men's bathroom with like four toilets and like three stalls, you must have a women's bathroom that has at least X number of the time, X times as many toilet facilities as the men's bathroom. Uh, all the laws require uh, one to one or higher, the highest being four to one. These these laws were, are important, and I think they're an important stopgap to make the differences in wait times less. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're never going to have equal time between two bathrooms because the two groups are never going to be the same size. They're never going to have the same needs. Uh, where's those laws? Are they like, enforced also in trucks and stuff? So they're part of the building codes. <laughs> so they're usually only enforced once. There might need to be more of them. <laughs> A lot of bathroom related laws are not enforced. Uh, but in, in these cases, these, these relate to building codes, so they're usually only enforced once or in the event of a complaint. Um, so just prior to the issuance of your certificate of occupancy or after a complaint. And what's pretty common practice for all kinds of building code things is to set up your business in one way and then change it after the inspection. Any question? Uh, do you have any idea about the history of the body party rules? Uh, I believe they started to pass um, with the rise of like second wave feminism in the, in the 60s. Uh, the big protest, I think, had one of the Kennedys dumping jars of piss on, uh, I think, the you know, university administration building. It seems like it was pretty dramatic. <laughs> uh, this one's a little bit complicated, but the, one of the big arguments people have against ending gender segregation is that uh, it would make bathrooms less safe. 
that uh, the current system gives uh, you know women a space that's safe and free of male attackers. Uh, but the only thing keeping a male attacker out of a women's room is a sign. And the statistics on assaults in women's bathrooms show that there's clearly no deterring there's no deterrent value to that sign for an ill will attacker. Um, the advantage of desegregating the bathrooms is uh, often desegregated bathrooms don't have a door and they have much more traffic and any person can enter that space um, either incidentally in the course of the bathroom use or you know in patrols in order to see see what's going on. Um, so you're much more likely to not be alone in an unsegregated bathroom and uh, it's, yeah, this is my least favorite one conversation to have just because it, it feels like it's pitting two groups of oppressed people against each other. And I just, uh, all the data I've seen has shown that it wouldn't make things any worse. Yeah, one of the biggest fears I've noticed is, you know, I have 11 grandchildren and their parents are worried about, um, like, like putting the, putting the girls in a, gender neutral bathroom and exposing them to pedophiles and stuff like that. Yeah. I just, that, that's a fear. I don't know if you know if it's I don't brown. see what would keep the pedophiles out of the bathroom right. as it is. Yeah. It's not true that the sign is the thing keeping you out because if, if there's a woman in the system you see a man in the women's bathroom, even if she's not committing some kind of sexual offense, it's still like a violation of this that's true. So, so as a man, you want to not go to a woman's bathroom and, and see, is there any, is there a single person in here that I can, Yeah, I mean, I just, I, 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 I think that if, if the circumstances would allow an assault, then it would probably mean that the bathroom wasn't, the bathroom area wasn't very well watched in the first place. And it seems like most of the gender neutral bathrooms that I've seen are single occupancy. Yeah, they often are, and that doesn't mean that assault can't occur in them. Right, right. Uh, but uh, a lot of single occupant bathrooms, for example, in Europe, all have alarms, uh, primarily for if a disabled person who's alone uh, experiences an episode, they can call for help. Uh, but such alarms probably should be installed in any room with a lock in a public space. Green spots. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Positive aspects of this investigation. Um, this one's surprising. You can actually fit more toilets uh, total in the bathroom by demolishing the center wall and redesigning the bathroom. Uh, most of that space savings comes from the fact that the American with Disabilities Act requires, requires that the hallway into the bathroom uh, be four feet wide, you know, uh, 1.34 meters wide. Uh, which is an exceptionally large amount of space, and if that space, and, and if you have one large bathroom, you only need to have one of those. It doesn't affect, doesn't negatively affect the accessibility, but it gives you a lot more uh, land in which to build toilets. So that's good. More, more capacity without making your building any bigger. Excuse me. Yes. I have a question. Do you think that in the, in the U.S. the the width is larger than in Europe because people would be more overweighted? No, I think the reason the width is larger than the United States is because the United States has much more aggressive and meaningful protections for people with disabilities, um, especially for wheelchair users. Uh, and since most of the buildings in the United States are newer, it's been a lot easier for us to enforce those laws, which were passed in the 90s. Um, there has been, uh, you know, larger people have necessitated a, a change in toilet design in the United States which is that the seat uh, is now much higher off the ground. Um, in, uh, I think it's required to be higher off the ground any time the toilet is switched. So, you know, about 100 millimeters, about four inches higher than uh, traditional. And that's in order to make it easier for larger people to get off the toilet. And the downside of that is that extra four inches actually uh, puts in a tremendous amount of additional strain on uh, your system uh, when when defecating, and we'll talk. That comes up a little bit later when we talk about the rise of the squatty potty. <laughs> um, reduce wait time on average for everyone. The potty parity laws only go so far. Um, you know, if you had a convention for that was attractive to a particular set of people, you know, like uh, for example, like a women in tech conference would have a much longer line 
at the women's room and there'd be no amount of potty parity law that would accommodate that disparity. But if there was just one toilet, uh, everyone would have a shorter time on average. So, sorry, a quick question. In a um, John Dermix toilet, um, is it still possible to have urinatory? I don't know the name in English. In a dynamic toilet? No, uh, John Dermix. Uh, well, right. that's a good question, and I think we have 20 slides about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very big question. Um, we do stress for people with persons with disabilities and their attendants. Um, this is just the red slide upside down. <laughs> we do stress for guardians and children. Um, I think this especially becomes an issue uh, when your children are, you know, like kind of on the line between like potty training and not potty training, and you still want to attend them, but you don't you feel like your excuse is kind of wearing a little bit thin and you don't want to be called out for like accused of using your child as a tool to gain access to like a sexualized and complicated space. So I think uh, parents of children um, in all configurations uh, have a lot of trouble with this. Uh, interestingly, I think California was the first state to pass a law saying that men's rooms needed to have changing stations. And I believe that was three years ago. So I think like two or three states noticed the insane sexism, which is the implication that men are incapable of changing the baby's diapers. <laughs> um, this one's kind of minor, but I think many of us have probably been in a bathroom that's been closed while a differently gendered person cleans it. Um, this is an absurd inconvenience for everybody. It's extra work and extra stress on the cleaner, and uh, there's no reason for it. Uh, I think this is similar to the third type of thing, but again, I'll sit down. Fewer established divisions by gender will reduce gender, gender essentialism in society at large. I think especially among children. Um, you know, the, the bathroom is such a fixating point for a developing mind, you know, as, as, as a challenging space, as a strange space, as a space that I'm not allowed to talk about. And the fact that as soon as they enter school, they're divided into two groups. And the, you know, the, the gossip is different, the, the, the traditions are different, the rituals are different. Um, I think it's probably more, has a more powerful effect than they realize. Vastly increased quality of life for trans and gender non-conforming people who no longer have to stress about, you know, a, they, they have to have a lot less stress about assault, confrontation, and urinary tract infections if all bathrooms everywhere were just for all people. Um, Increased privacy for people with religious needs. Uh, through the process of researching this project, I found out that um, Muslim men are uh, often prohibited by religious belief uh, from peeing standing up or using urinals. Uh, also, uh, there's a stronger culture of privacy um, in varying cultures. Uh, you know, you know, Orthodox Jewish people, certain certain Muslim groups, and just people who like privacy and. Uh, I think with the degenerating of bathrooms, we're tearing down walls anyway, we can get rid of all those insane oversights of stall gaps and actually design a bathroom with humans' needs and desires in mind. Um, access to menstrual supplies for people of all genders. Um, this is a big issue for uh, trans men who no longer have access to menstrual supplies or sanitary bins uh, in the bathroom. They have to choose between uh, flushing things that cannot be flushed, uh, sneaking across the bathroom with a fistful of menstrual supplies, um, or somehow hiding them in, on their person and sneaking them out, uh, or else face confrontation and humiliation. Um, this is also the lack of small trash cans in men's stalls is also an issue for people with many, many medical conditions, for the, you know, ranging from diabetes to uh, people who use catheters who generally um, flush their latex catheters down the toilet rather than be subject to additional embarrassment uh, for being exposed as a person who you know, uses catheters uh, in the view of the public and putting you know, medical waste on top of paper towels in full view of all their peers. Um, opposite of the last, last slide, uh, increased security by increasing foot traffic and allowing any person to check on the bathroom. New color. Gender neutral bathrooms already exist, right? All of you have gender neutral bathrooms in your home. Uh, all the bathrooms in this building are gender neutral. 
Uh, I believe there's one airline that had gendered airplane toilets, but they're generally unpopular because of the wait time problem. Um, yeah, I think that it's not such a radical idea. There's a great Onion article that was just like, uh, Mitt Romney found with gender neutral bathroom in his own home. Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> 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 Great. The rest of the talk is about what I think uh, bathrooms might look like in the future. The it's a super complicated thing to take apart a bathroom and make it degendered. My project is only a sign. Uh, I'll talk more about the project toward the end, but uh, the sign is not enough. Uh, I, the previous slides probably implied that serious architectural changes have to take place before a truly inclusive bathroom can be built. Um, the original sign signage, well, the, the first use of icons of you know, essentialized gender norms uh, bubbled up in the 1920s, I believe in Switzerland. And uh, the icon set we know, we know and have mixed feelings about today uh, was finalized in 1977 uh, between the American Institute of Graphic Artists and the Department of Transportation for use in airports. And they quickly caught on as like the standard icon set for everywhere, including a little police person looking for bananas. <laughs> um, in 2015-2016, many states, uh, ludicrous preponderance of states, I believe 40 states, proposed uh, laws that would limit someone's use of a bathroom to uh, their sex assigned at birth. Uh, through an incredible force of activism and like a little shred of hope in this kind of storm of a political season, uh, none of them passed. Uh, I think Georgia's was on the books for the longest, but most of them were either struck down by courts or never made it through the legislature. What kind of uh, laws was that? They were laws that would have made it illegal to use any bathroom that didn't match the gender you were assigned at birth. So if you know a girl was on a birth certificate, you could get fined for using uh, a men's restroom. Uh, on the other side of the coin. So you, you said they failed to pass. So yeah, they all failed to pass. Right. None of these bills are active. I mean, there's still tons of discrimination and tons of like, uh, you know, interpersonal uh, animosity and assaults. But uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, none of them pass. On the other side, oh yes. Sorry. Uh, is there any law that? Stop cis people from using uh, bathrooms of the other No, not that I know of. Um, California, I believe, was the first state to require any single occupant bathroom in a space accessible to the public to be all gender. Um, this has probably 1% enforcement. Uh, it's starting in big businesses because big, big, like you know, chain, like you know, Chipotle's and gas stations and that kind of thing. They have compliance departments. They have people whose job it is to look for new laws and be like, oh, what compliance? Um, so the law states that any door, any bathroom that locks, has to be all gender. Uh, and this has led to the overnight degendering of thousands of bathrooms, uh, and including in some cases, uh, a funny situation is if. The men's bathroom had a stall and a urinal with no dividers, and the women's bathroom had two stalls, which is a pretty common arrangement. You know, it's like a two and then a one, a one, one, two arrangement, I think it's called. Uh, the women's bathroom having two stalls is a multi occupied bathroom and can remain a women's bathroom. The men's bathroom having their stalls, unfortunately, became an all gender bathroom. I mean, not unfortunately, I think it's hilarious. So you have an all-gender bathroom and a women's bathroom next to each other. There's no men's bathroom. And when you open the door to the all-gender bathroom, there's a urinal. Which is like... <laughs> so uh, I think it's a great uh, little... Uh, it was clearly a mistake in the bill that, you know, they... Uh, but I think that it's a great instance where men are finally forced to wait for the bathroom for the first time in their lives. Well, because <laughs> their only bathroom is a sometimes bathroom. Is this enforced right now? No. Uh, the only methods of enforcement are consumer complaints to direct to uh, local building departments. Uh, I'm working on adding to the website like a form letter that you can email to places. My te technique so far has been being like, hey, like, oh my god, this burrito was so good. Do you have a business card? 
And then I see this jack of business cards, and at some point I send out a mail order to be like, hey, business owner, I'm sure this is an oversight, but get it fixed. Um, I think this is great, but um, since most public restrooms are multi occupant, it doesn't really help all that much. Also, I don't think that the majority of confrontations were happening in single occupant bathrooms, because the amount of time you have to confront somebody is so much more limited if you only have the moment where they're coming out of the bathroom. And I also think that the, the degree to which uh, transphobic bigots are rubs the wrong way is a lot more related to like co-presence and a lot less related to propriety, but I'm not sure about that. I mean, I've never really hung out with one. Um, gender graphic pictures in general. Uh, menstrual supplies or risk bins in the stalls, I mentioned those. Changing tables. Still in 2020, apparently a genuine thing. Uh, the existence of urinals, which we're going to get to later, it's, it's a deep one. And vending machines, uh, what they sell, what they don't sell. Um, the ads and signage and like weird decorations, you know, like the, it's not uncommon in like men's bars to have like, you know, naked pinup curls or to have urinal shaped like women's lips or just like deep and dark and weird stuff that really has no place. In a room that none of us have an option but to use. Um, the graffiti is included in the art. <laughs> I made this info. Sorry, I, I made this infographic today, and I have mixed feelings about it just because it implies that like things are almost perfect. Uh, but I thought I'd make a chart about the history of public bathrooms, and uh, very little about the talk about private bathrooms because they're much less controversial. But uh, there was a 50-year gap between the first public toilets for men and the first public toilets for women. 50 years. Most public toilets for women uh, were closed within a few weeks of opening uh, because uh, women under like the close surveillance of pedestrians just didn't have the social option of actually using them and uh, didn't have money. Uh, is it adjusted for inflation it was $6 to use a toilet um, for a demographic that had almost no employment. Um, the uh, and all the first uh, some of the in the case of one of the infographic wasn't the case, but uh, often urinals were free and stalls were you know a penny, which somehow just for inflation is six dollars. I think that's the smallest unit of money. I guess it was at the time, but it was something small. Um, then moving on to the 1960s, the Civil Rights Act passes technically desegregating toilets by race, but you know de facto segregation remained for a long time. Um, and then the 1991 or 1990, the American with Disabilities Act passes, uh, which was, a, I think, a pretty impressive miracle of legislation that has led to more architectural changes than I think any other piece of legislation in global history, you know, and uh, requiring elevators, installing ramps, uh, making stalls wider, you know, redesigning toilet seats, making uh, it's thousands of pages long, and it's uh, many architects aren't so fond of it because of how much work it entails, but it's good for the world. Do you like you're talking about money there? Like, do you get into, do you have slides on like the difference between American bathrooms being free versus the rest of the world, like having some fee to use the bathroom? Like, it is interesting. I would counter that American bathrooms aren't free, and that you often have to buy something worth more, much more than a euro in order to use them. It seems to be that the European and Asian system is just a lot more honest about the transaction. We're here, you just go over, like, I gotta use a bathroom, like, it's for customers only, I'm like, okay, I'll get a, a macchiato. And then, like, you wait a little bit, and you have to go use it. But yeah, I think yeah. in urban situations, definitely, but not outside of the city, I think. Okay. It is an interesting cultural difference, but I, I'm not at any for it. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping that sometime in question mark, question mark, question mark, uh, there's a future where anybody can use any toilet, any time, hopefully for free, because yes. Everybody has needs, and not everybody has money. Well, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, and I know in Santa Clara, they have the pit stops. Yeah. So, so those, I think those are, would be great if there were more of them, if they were open 24-7, yeah. and if they didn't exist as the barrage of symbolic band-aid solutions the city's using. You know, the, yeah. those toilets, those self-cleaning toilets are a monstrosity. You know, they, they only exist so that uh, 
French company makes ads. Je suis déco. Thank you. Of course, <laughs> c'est déco. And uh, plaster San Francisco with advertisements. <laughs> they, they're designed to check a box. They're more than enough, like, it, it would be trivial to establish meaningful public facilities for all of the people who call the streets them ho their homes through, you know, the corrosion of local businesses and through the permanent installation of actual fixtures. But I had a public arts piece on Market Street, and uh, I, that's how I learned the hard way that the reason why Market Street doesn't have any benches, the reason why there's nothing on Market Street that's horizontal, because anything that you can sit on, sit under, lay on or lay under, is removed within days by the Business Improvement District, which is a group of you know, greedy retail establishments that have complete control over what happens on that street. Market Street had 10,000 benches. 10,000 solid granite benches that are currently rotting in some field because businesses thought it was driving down, thought they were driving down sales. So I think pit stops are a lot better than nothing. Is that the one with the homeless to hang out there mm -hmm. and sleep on the benches? Yeah, they think that benches cause homelessness. Or well, the businesses have managed, have managed to convince the city of that. And since you know, money talks... It's a local solution for a slightly larger problem, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's business. just... It's super tragic. Um, but yeah. And I'm sure there's but some... The money, and, like, in, isn't most of the, the structure of like, the... the Bathrooms that you pay for in Russia and China and so on. Like, if, if you if you pay for the bathroom, the, the money usually directly goes to the person that cleans the bathroom. Like, they're the attendant and also the cleaner. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it, I imagine it got split somehow. No, I, I think it's like like in many places in Eastern Europe. So they, they work in commission. They, no, they they straight up they they don't pay anyone to clean the bathroom. The person that collects the money also cleans the bathroom. Ah. And that's the exchange. Like, if, that's really they keep, keep it clean. Like. Hmm. It's, it's a very the lack of bathroom, the, the loss of bathroom attendance, I think, is a really interesting thing. And uh, another advantage of non under bathrooms is that your attendant cost would go down, maybe far enough for it to be practical again. Um, but I think bathroom attendance solved a lot of the bathroom problems, ranging from assault to poor right. sanitation. Um, something that I think is really overlooked is, is toilet training. You know, the I think that if elementary school level children were all taught a cohesive set of tactics for bathroom use. People would know you can't get herpes from a toilet seat. People would know like all, that many of the ways they're using the bathroom are you know bad for their health and bad for the commons. But because it's all just outsourced to people who learned when they were five years old from their parents who learned when they were five years old, there's no chance for like systemic uh, real education. A shred of hope. Uh, the squatting pile. Uh, people, you know, after many decades of imperialist countries forcing civilized toilets upon the developing world, uh, people finally realized that the commonly held belief that squat toilets are much healthier for you uh, was in fact entirely true. Um, and uh, these uh, squatty potty stools are becoming much more popular and they realign, uh, they reduce the strain on the muscle that uh, holds one's anus closed to make, uh, I think it's like a third as strenuous in terms of like calories burned. And I think that you're able to evacuate much more of your bowels uh, just by keeping your feet off the ground. And a tragedy is that the seats have actually raised significantly um, in public restrooms. Um, in order to make it easier for large people to get up and sit down. And this is a question, this is a, this is a case where it's a super complicated design problem, where the ideal design solution would be that all toilets everywhere are squat toilets. Everyone's retrained. Everyone has better digestive health. Um, the gender divisions break, break down. Uh, it's no longer possible to pee on the seat and to have you know, two groups of people perpetually blaming the other group for now it's the squatters, now it's the standards. You know, all these problems would go away overnight, but there's just no practical way to change culture that severely that quickly. Um, I think so. If everybody's toilet is going to like squat toilet, yeah. uh, disability people have like might have issue with it. 
Right. I think uh, the the disabled stall would probably have to stay like a standard height Western toilet. Um, and you say Western because China, like obviously, like, squat toilets are much much more common than. <laughs> yeah, but it, I think that the I think that in some circles in China the sit toilet has become like a it's, it's becoming status a symbol of privilege, which is like. It's, it's yeah. It's so it's it's kind of a tragedy of uh, of toilets. Um, also, uh, washlets. Uh, these are bidets that you install on your toilet seat, and they can range from like fifty dollars to probably many thousands of dollars. And uh, toilet paper is kind of a weird idea. The metaphor people often use is just like if a bird shat on your face, would you wipe off your face with a piece of paper, or would you wash your face? Most people would wash their face. Uh, the uh, yeah, the there was a British study that did analysis on trousers to find how how much like, <laughs> feces and urine deposit was there, and it's it's unsurprisingly significant. <laughs> when you think about the mechanics of everything that's going on, especially uh, with in regards to urine deposits, uh, men not using any toilet paper in the process of urinating. Uh, it's totally unsurprising that pants are soaked in dried urine, <laughs> and to a lesser extent in, in fecal deposits. But these are great. Uh, I recommend purchasing one. There is a showroom that exclusively shows these across the street from the ballpark uh, in San Francisco. Um, I don't know if they're plugged in, but you can definitely look at them. <laughs> There's also one at the end of this hallway. <laughs> so everyone is encouraged. <laughs> um, Sitting to pee for people who were taught to stand. Um, I'm a proponent of it. I'm going to give you my argument. Take it or leave it. Uh, in the German speaking world, uh, there's been a very uh, surprisingly expedient movement over the past 20 or 30 years um, for people to become a Sitzpiken, which are those who sit to pee, um, specifically men who, who sit to pee. Um, it's a shocking, it, it, given how rare it was you know, 30 years ago, it's become shockingly prevalent for German men uh, who were taught originally to stand, uh, to mostly at the insistence of the women in their lives, uh, come around to the more relaxing and practical method of urine loss. Signs like this are everywhere, um, often with associated German poems about the advantages. <laughs> Uh, the first reason why it's better, bathroom sanitation. Anyone who's ever cleaned a toilet knows that stand piers are prone to splashing. 86% um, of maids and house cleaners are female. Um, it stands to reason that most of the pee that is spilled by a man is cleaned up by women, um, which is a feminist issue and is also an issue where uh, it's like, likely that a significant portion of men are not aware of the proportion of the problem. Just a question, so you're talking about for using toilets, not urinals, right? Because the water use is... We'll get there, okay. great question. Uh, especially, the German, the Sitzpickel movement is only for toilets. There's nobody in Germany or, uh, trying to ban uh, urinals. Um, personal hygiene. Uh, no matter how you shake and dance, the last two drops uh, through your pants. Um, significant deposits of urine were found in the British study I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's widely known that users of women's rooms use toilet paper for defecation and urination. Uh, the implication that there's somehow something so different about the way men urinate that toilet paper wouldn't be necessary doesn't stand up to even like 30 seconds of thought. Right? Same tube, different place, still pee in the tube. <laughs> One gender is taught just to shove it all back in their clothes, and the other gender is taught to blot and dab prior to the reapplication of clothing. Isn't urine sterile? I mean, <laughs> is sterility really the thing you're worried about when cleaning something? So, yeah. 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 Excuse me, I've never been to a men's restroom, but the solution would be to put some toilet paper in front of the urinal, and that's it. Do you think so? Yeah, yeah. Urinals yeah. can't pass on the <laughs> You don't flush it. 
But there will be like a special stuff to flush it. So. <laughs> But you just lost like the plastic box. Is it a problem to drop? I mean, like, <laughs> like, how, how often do you wash your pants? My pants? My underwear every day. No, no, you don't have pants. How often do you wash your jeans? Less frequently, but like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. Five times a day, like, no one's we're talking not. about hundreds so, of times. Like, yeah, yeah, no, no. Like, as, as mentioned, it's sterile, and I've literally never ever noticed it in my life, so yeah. I just don't care. Look, like, Jake, you know, Jake, you know, you know, you know, there's a lot of pee in your pants. Whether it's sterile or not, it's one question. Like, it may be. There's pee on the bathroom door. If you have a fully healthy urinary system, if you have a fully healthy urinary system, uh, yes, pee doesn't have as very, very little microbiological activity, but dirt isn't defined as microbiological activity. It's defined as things that are where they're not supposed to be. So, and to me, pee yeah. on my pants. I think no. Is this a problem for society that, like, <laughs> after 30 years, has never been a problem for me? Neither in terms of hygiene or smell or anything. No. Um, I think you're all kids are having your mind blown, and I'm working on it. <laughs> Next one health benefits. <laughs> Um, peeing in a position that uh, is the same position used for defecation would undoubtedly lead, lead to more frequent defecation, right? You know, maybe you don't think you have to poop, turns out you could have, but you won't know if you're not in the position that enables it, especially if you're using a squatty potty, <laughs> which <laughs> much more effectively enables the cleansing one bowels. Also, men who regularly assume a sitting stance have fewer prostate problems. Um, this was found in a medical study that I can send anybody who wants to read it. Uh, sitting down leads to a more complete emptying of the bladder, saving you, meaning you have to make fewer trips to the bathroom. And uh, on average, it took 0.86 fewer seconds to pee sitting down than standing up because you're able to pee faster. And that more than enough should make up for the amount of time lost to pulling your pants down and then up again. I just want them to just take the seat up and at least. <laughs> That's yeah, all I there's guess. still if they, even if they raise they raise the seat, there's still going to be a lot of pee on the walls and the floor. Look at this. You see that stain on the wall? <laughs> that <laughs> urine <laughs> ate through. <laughs> what? That <laughs> Every, every steel toilet stall partition that's more than like 10 years old, the urine has eaten through half a millimeter thick powder coat. So powder coating is a method where steel uh, is electrically charged and powder paint is applied to the surface and then it's baked into an oven until the, the steel is in completely encased in plastic. It's a very thick and resilient coating. It's suitable for being underwater and the sea. It's considered indestructible. This is what happens when you put powder coated steel next to a urinal and wait 10 years. Uh, excuse me? Yes. I have a comment on this. I was told that um, now they put like a plastic fly. Yeah, this one has one. one. Yeah. And that men are like more incentivized to like look at <laughs> this little stuff. Yeah. And apparently they pee better, right? Yeah, they're, they're, they're performing the role so of So we have solution. <laughs> They pee better, but it doesn't eliminate the splash. You like the game, no? Um, my biggest, the thing I find the weirdest about urinals, and the reason why I think that it's, uh, if, if urinals were invented today, I think there's literally no chance they would be installed in the way they currently are. Um, I'm going to read what I wrote because I think it was better. Um, potty training for men takes as a given that there's some sensible advantage to the culturally charged masculine practice of upright urination. In order to acknowledge the mechanical, fluidic, medical, logical, and social drawbacks of this urination method, one would have to call in question the very deep-seated tradition of elimination. Um, now, what I said was better. That was kind of just wordy. Um, splashing. Uh, there's a lot of splashing. The I you know you can go on YouTube and you can see like microfluidic experts with high speed cameras videotaping people peeing in the urinals and coming to the conclusion that splash proof urinals are not possible. The urine stream uh, is not cohesive enough. There's too many factors at play. People have different heights, and 
Uh, there's just no way you can move fluid that far with that force without experiencing splashing. Um, my biggest issue with urinals is the complete lack of privacy. Um, even when dividers are present, they're designed so that a person of regular height next to a person of regular height can easily look at each other's genitals. <laughs> um, there's a really nice quote here uh, from a, a theorist named Lee Edelman. The law of the men's room decrees that men's dicks be available for public contemplation <laughs> at the urinal precisely to a, a, allow a mandate that no such contemplation may ever take place. <laughs> the existence of urinals is this constant, vigilant exchange where you're intentionally given an opportunity to look and prohibited to do so in order to enforce a homophobic event. Have you ever used a public shower? I think that's... <laughs> no, I, that's a different thing. In a public shower, there's no tiny, symbolic uh, notion of privacy. Also, a public shower is a much more rare thing than a, than a urinal is. The implication that this has the same standard of privacy as a stall is absurd. I just think that peeing should also not be sexualized. You know, somehow yeah. it's it's okay that it's open and you can, Real but then you just have an option to go to a private room to do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's fine to have it open. I think. Why? But why? Why is it fine to have these open but not the well, stalls? you should just. Take the, the separators. Yes. Well, most places don't have separators. What about, yeah, they yeah. usually don't. No, but, but it's also fine. So yeah. What, should stalls have separations? Not necessarily. You can choose to go in your private but The wall walks improves. more when you're using a urinal than they would have a toilet. But, the the know, wall blocks most. Like, you can side eye people, but a toilet, you're just having to go. I mean, I could. If I were so inclined, I would have no difficulty ascertaining the nature of your penis at a urinal. <laughs> yeah, but you, you have to make it. You have to come up and. She has to make it. I would have to try. Yeah. I, I, I think we should also. I think the whole thing about also separating between genders is comes because we are sexualizing the fact that we are taking off our clothes, which is not really necessary. Like it, I think. I don't know if you you say that in Europe we all have like separated stalls. I don't it's not true. Yeah. Remember that it's <laughs> like I, I think that Europeans have a much more relaxed uh, uh, feeling about privacy in these matters, which could be peeing, but it could also be uh, like um, common like showers or whatever. That's very that's I, very common. In I lived in Berlin for a year while I was working on this project, and I never found a stall gap uh, greater than uh, like 150 centimeters, millimeters. The I don't think you're saying that just normally just like a like long. Yeah, yeah. different. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the <laughs> It just I just find this very strange thing. With this, the, the thing that bothers me about urinals isn't that I demand privacy. It's the implication that privacy be afforded to women and pooping men yes. and not to peeing men. That's and that there's this performance about being a peeing man. And that being a being seen standing in a stall when a urinal is available is like a deep, shameful thing for users of a men's room. Because it means that there's something about you that's weak and unmasculine and that you've chosen privacy <laughs> over convenience. That you've chosen to do the womanly thing uh -huh. instead of your birthright as a man. And I think that all this insane, loaded, cultural crap about gender has no place in a room we have to go to so often. There's, there's an incredibly, like, there's, there's a phrase, he's standing up, like, in, like there, that, 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 that is asserting masculinity. Like, yes. Like, it's very connected to that, I think. Absolutely. I'm gonna take privacy out of the equation. I like that. Partition because it's going to keep the other guy's splash from getting on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in favor of partitions. I just want them to cover your eyes. <laughs> it's just like you know, how many more dollars would it cost for you know one you know another? I, I don't. I don't care if it's checking me out. I just want to get splashed. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> 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 Great. 
Oh, no way. Did you know the song? No. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was so so this uh, a Wikipedia user very uh, diligently illustrated the three types of urinals uh, for our consumption. Uh, there's the urinal designed for men, uh, which, I put to, which I put into spare quotes because honestly I can't figure out a better way to describe people who socialize being standing up because both holes are called urethras. <laughs> right? It's hard. Try to find a term. Um, the middle urinal is designed for anyone. Uh, people with close sitting urethras uh, face away from the wall, uh, lean forward about like 20 or 30 degrees, and squat slightly and uh, use it similar to the way a hovering person would use a traditional toilet. Um, it would, the, the configuration of the hybridization of the shape, uh, people with different genital configurations can use urinal number two uh, with similar ease. Uh, the only difference being the whether they face away from the wall or toward the wall. So can women also face towards the wall? Uh, I believe that some can, but that most women uh, haven't uh, is trained themselves to uh, aim that configuration. I have a book that I'd highly recommend. Uh, there's, I think there's only like a couple hundred copies of it in the world. Um, but most universities have a copy. It's called The Bathroom by Alexander Kira. And it's 700 pages of diagrams, including uh, photographs on gridded backgrounds of people with different bodies peeing. And talking about, uh, it was published in the 70s, not a single one of its arguments are taken seriously. And all of its arguments are gold. It talks about, it talks about these, like, how bathtubs are like death traps and like, the number one I think the number one household killer of elderly people, and then nothing has been done, done, done to address this. How toilet seats aren't ergonomic for anybody. How the way, you know, like it, it was decades ahead of its time. It was the entire life's work of this furious bathroom man. Completely ignored. Um, here are uh, bathrooms for women. Uh, they've been installed in a few Austrian train stations. Um, the you know, unlike regular toilets, these come with instructions. I would propose that all toilets should come with instructions in order to kind of level the playing field of who knows what. Uh, my German's not great. Uh, you can use the urinal easily. Uh, use a toilet for her. Uh, a little science. Uh, <laughs> we'll go a long way. Is that right? Can I just turn? What, where are you? Uh, here. Uh, <laughs> That would be a science. I think a little science would go a long way. It's a urinal something higher. Uh, it's higher than a man's a man toilet. That doesn't matter. You can see the diagrams. A uh, bit important. Uh, the, work, the urinal works without water. Uh, do not. Uh, Flush things down. Uh, throw your toilet paper in the in the bin in the bucket. This seems like it raises a lot of privacy concerns. <laughs> it's no different. Do you have a different standard of privacy for men and women? No, you have to take your pants all the way down for this. Yeah. Unless you're wearing a skirt, you're facing forward. So, so in the bath urinal, you really have to take it down. Like if you take it down like here, right? You're like crouching. Like you only have to have well, like, the buttons. The, the, the pants will get in the way of the person. Wait, y'all don't get totally naked. Do you guys see it? Why does it mean you have to have the pants below the ears? There's no way of the attention to speak in the background. So here's my question. I have a solution. I have a solution that hopefully everybody will like. Who here has used a port potty? How many of those porta potties have urinals? Most. Most, right? Let's just do that. But instead of a porta potty that has a urinal for men and a toilet for everybody, this is my shitty drawing, shitty 10 minutes. Uh, every stall has a all sex, all secondary sex characteristics, all genital, whatever, all your reason placement. <laughs> Find me a term. It's looking so hard. Uh, a urinal that anybody can use and a toilet that anybody can use. Uh, because, now this is going to be a shocker, uh, according to the only study ever conducted, 
85% of British women have never intentionally touched a public toilet seat. Uh, in the case of British women, 85% hover in public spaces. Uh, and the toilet was designed by men, by male engineers, uh, in a culture that didn't allow discussion of these things. So I think that the emergence of the natural behavior uh, for urination uh, is something that went unnoticed and was never subject to design review, which is that the toilet as it currently is designed isn't suitable really for anyone. It's not suitable for anyone defecating because of your colon misalignment. It's not suitable uh, for men who seem to, despite my best efforts, prefer to stand. It's not <laughs> suitable for women who, despite you know the best efforts of potty police who scold the hoverers, prefer to hover. Uh, it's clear that we need. I think good design doesn't dictate new behavior on the users, um, unless that behavior is you know is natural and easy. You've got to meet people where you're at. And having a two fixture toilet stall, um, logistical concerns aside of having to plumb that tiny, thin partition, <laughs> I think would solve a lot of the problems. Uh, but having said that, most architects, uh, you know, theorists, activists, and like you know, disability, disability and trans activists who are campaigning for new architectural designs for bathrooms uh, just approach the all-sit toilet method, um, which I think is also a sensible solution, but uh, it comes with a, a large burden of cleaning. But that might just be the price we pay for continued taboo of toilet stuff. Oh, uh, also, uh, we lost. <laughs> uh, a German landlord uh, took their tenant to court because Ken, I believe, did like 4,000 euros? No. Uh, did the, the, the landlord did 3,000 euros worth of repairs to the unsealed stone floors in the bathroom because the tenant's urine had eaten away a disgusting pattern of filth. Oh, but it was sterile. <laughs> it's caustic, but it's sterile. Um, in, the, in the floor. Uh, unfortunately, the landlord, the landlord had never told the tenant that, you know, uh, here we are sit -tank them. You know, there's no dictate that this was a sit-down peeing property. And the question to the court was, do men have a default and intrinsic habit of peeing? And the court unfortunately sided with the heathen. And uh, with the big dead set of the tongue. Um, I think you should design a bathroom, but from a stand Sorry? It is your, your bathroom should be able to withstand your like just by default. <laughs> I would argue that the floor isn't a good place for your end, but like right, takes their own. Like, you don't know about like meeting people like, where they are, right? Like it's or, not like you know, it's not like a, a surprise that like splash exists, right? You, you meet people where the like both for fear is splash. It is possible that the landlord would generally surprised that a modern German man would be a standing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not the biggest fan of landlords. Uh, menstrual splice. Uh, bins like these are absent from almost all men's rooms. Uh, lots of people menstruate, they're not all women, and they're an important thing for, you know, not only menstruation, but for medical uh, you know, practices like uh, using catheters and uh, insulin, that kind of thing. Vending machines, talk about these briefly. Uh, they tend to sell different things depending on which bathroom you're in. For example, menstruation supplies and, like, you know, pills for virility and sex toys and <laughs> toothbrush balls. Oh, I've seen a machine in a truck stop where you put it in a quarter and you push the button and it sprayed perfume out of a nozzle at your face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that didn't go wrong. Um, weird sex and art choices. Uh, I almost put in one of the ones of the urinals that are shaped like like painted lips, but I thought it would be too graphic. So I found this one instead. This isn't weird. Like shit like this is super common. Um, I'm sure the person who did this thought was very clever. Uh, is, not, there a, is there a brand message to the left of? I imagine. I don't know. Uh, if there's not somebody, somebody's going to pay a lot for these photos. Uh, 
A lot of people have come before me with really good work on the subject. This is the project called Sol, which is a collaborator between a trans historian and theorist, a disability lawyer, and an architect. Uh, hold on. I forgot to check sound. Gotta get it. Replacing the typical skulls who's revealing gaps, compromise privacy with focusing partitions and communal areas for washing and grooming. We've developed a process for retrofitting sex segregated restrooms that takes the multi user approach a step further. First, we remove the plumbing step wall and treat the bathroom as one open space. We then eliminate the corner. It's longer than this, but it's good. Uh, it talks about uh, where the space comes from, and it talks about uh, an airport prototype that has even more space, but uh, they all lack urinals. So if that's a non-starter for you, then that's that. Any questions about bathrooms before I talk about my project? Great. Um, so as was probably made clear by the previous things, I'm a big fan of all gender bathrooms. Uh, my project is called The Degenerator, and it is it is this little kinetic doll. Uh, it's shown these one, this one is solar powered, but I'm working on the battery powered version because, unsurprisingly, bathrooms aren't bright enough. Uh, <laughs> um, it runs forever. It's going to run for like two or three years on two double A's, and it constantly spends time uh, in all kinds of states between person in dress and person in pants. Uh, to me, I see this as kind of like a humorous vehicle uh, for degenerating a bathroom to ride on. Um, I don't see this icon as encapsulating the myriad ways that gender is expressed. 
uh, nor as a better icon than has typically been proposed for gender-neutral toilets, which is, in fact, a picture of a toilet, uh, which is why that every one of these would ship with a ADA-compliant, you know, uh, braille bathroom sign that on one side says all gender restroom, and on the other side says inclusive restroom, and people can pick a side based on whether or not the bathroom is actually accessible to people with disabilities. Um, the, I'm doing a Kickstarter campaign, which is like a get three, give three situation that's going to run at zero revenue, where uh, you pay probably about 50 or 60 bucks for a three pack of dolls, a three pack of signs, and probably a little scene. And then uh, some vandal or, you know, uh, uh, trans group or nonprofit space or space that can't afford the signs gets a set of three signs on their own. And yeah, uh, I have to make 5,000 units in order for the factory to return my calls. So um, <laughs> that means I have to sell 686 kits of three, and give away 686 kits of three, which will lead hopefully to a couple thousand bathrooms uh, getting 50 new signs. Um, Despite the fact that it comes with a little robot, uh, these are actually cheaper than bathroom signs um, because I'm not turning a profit and because these are injection molded and many bathroom signs are custom made one at a time and meet this particular fonts and colors of the business uh, in mind. See, I write the notes and then I say other things and I'm like, what if I miss something in the notes? That was too late. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions about this project? Can we see the notes? Sure, it will stop moving once it's not rubbing on anymore. Okay. But you can pass it around. So the, it's going to have two AA batteries in the legs. It's going to move much slower, um, uh, like twice as slow. And uh, it's going to be about 40% taller. Because right now, only AAA batteries fit in the legs. They don't hold enough. <laughs> I think I have an idea for you. Can you make it like bright and like very visible and like white and lead colors and stuff? Because in nightclubs, we won't be able to see the best. So I'm hoping that this is all the, the brightness that it needs. Uh, if I put a light on it, the battery life would drop to a couple of days. And I don't think it would be reasonable for me to ask somebody to plug in the bathroom sign. Just because there's gonna, rarely going to be an outlet near there. Um, I'm hoping that black is dark enough that the wall will be a contrasting color. Um, people can adhere it to any surface that is not made of steel, because then the magnet will just stick to the door, and it will be perpetually stuck in some in-between state. And then the whole point will be ruined, and it won't be funny anymore. <laughs> um, my biggest concern is chewing gum. Transphobes and chewing gum. <laughs> The confluence of those two things, specifically. <laughs> I, I like that the dress looks like a cape to me. It's, yeah, it's in, like in order to make it fit, I had to like, shorten the dress like cool. 20%, yeah. um, because otherwise the the dress corner would protrude from the opposite side. Wouldn't the, like, because it looks like it's, wouldn't it like be better like in a liquid crystal where it like switches without moving? Uh, maybe. I mean, I would think it would be less funny. I'll help you, but like... <laughs> I, could, I mean, I could do it. I think the die cost would be high, and yeah. I don't think it would be nearly as funny. I think there's yeah. something really funny about the fact that it's actually moving. Yeah. It's the same circuit as those waving cats. Yeah. Um, and in fact, if it weren't those waving cats, this project wouldn't be possible, because that waving cat circuit is three cents. <laughs> Fair enough. At any quantity. Yeah. You can buy like ten of them for three cents. <laughs> um, the entire electrical bill of materials for a waving cat toy is just shy of eight cents, and that's me asking at my quantities. <laughs> wow. Um, no, the no. plastic injection molding and the labor of assembly and the packaging and the shipping is where all the cost goes, but you can find a waving cat toy on the market for less than a dollar in China. Yeah. Uh, and there is no shortage of factories that make waving cat toys. <laughs> These would be like, waving cat toy, so, <laughs> but this, and they were like, Okay, great. <laughs> 5,000 units. And I was like, oh. Wow. <laughs> That's kind of a lot, though. Yeah, you have to find them. Yeah, I went to, I spent um, three weeks in Shenzhen trying to find a factory and making sure the people I hired was hiring weren't, you know, yeah. like doing something I didn't like. 
and uh, learned a lot and found some people. Uh, speaking of Southern China, what do you think of just having coal in the ground? As a <laughs> um, Like seriously, it, uh, it it's very easy to clean. Uh, it doesn't matter who's using it or how. I've heard that such toilets leave a lot of I've heard that such toilets lead to disease problems, but I've heard that from like Western sources. So I'm suspect of anything relating to the developing world that I hear from and also Western you sources. Being on your shoes. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't, like I think it's a really complicated thing to talk about sanitation standards, and yeah. one of the reasons why I've only attempted to even mention that this project is like a U.S. and Canada, Canadian thing is because the the standards of like what what is a, like I, I don't think that it would be progressive to dictate that all bathrooms yes. everywhere in the world would be gender neutral because I just have no idea what global cultures around bathrooms resemble and like the sign is in English it's Braille is American Braille that's in like class two English standards it abides only by the American uh, legal standards for bathroom signs like this wouldn't necessarily be a legal sign to have in a European country or a non-English speaking country. Um, and yeah, global like universal design is a very complicated myth, I think. That but the hole in the ground, I mean it worked for a long time, but I think that it doesn't scale well. And I think that it leads to even poorer people cleaning it. If I'm running out of time, so I think we should take the last question, so otherwise we can also do it like afterwards. So, like. How long have you been working on this project? Um, more or less, um, I guess like three years, but I, it's usually been like a day a month, and then I put it on the back burner and then forget about it. But now I'm going full time. It's going to launch at the end in five weeks. Nice. Yeah. Ooh. Emails. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or if you encounter people who are doing work related to accessibility of toilets, uh, not related to disability, but related to just people having access to toilets when they need them. Uh, I am super interested in that topic, the, but I have done any. Um, very quickly, I wanted to acknowledge a previous project that's almost identical, done by the Genderettes, which is like a trans-run uh, <coughs> scientist group, where they distributed with Kickstarter a lot of quite permanent stickers for the gorilla degendering of bathrooms, um, and that was really successful in degendering bathrooms and in generating uh, awareness, as well as Sarah Hendren's project to redesign the personal wheelchair icon to be um, less clinical, uh, which actually became the legal bathroom icon in New York and Connecticut. Uh, and that was launched exclusively as a vandalism campaign, and then it became law. Thanks so much. Thank you.